Hi everyone, my name is Siamak and this is a June 2020 webinar from um, ACIGS, the International Geosynthetic Society Australasian chapter. Uh, just a quick intro, um, IGS is a, a global society in uh, more than 45 chapters around the world and um, ACIGS or ASICS um, covers Australia, New Zealand, um, PNG and um, South Pacific Islands. Um, you are familiar, I think, with the IGS website and the resources available to engineers and professionals in the geosynthetics industry. So basically, um, geosyntheticsociety.org is the website address. And uh, as a, a chapter member, you get full access to the IGS website and all the resources um, in there. Also the chapter website, acigs.org. Uh, we also have a lot of um, resources available, including the, um, uh, a little a, a video library, which um, basically includes all of the recordings from our um, previous events um, and lectures, and a recording of the, all of the webinars we've had so far. Uh, they're all accessible on the resources tab on our website. We also have a um, events tab, which you can see um, our future uh, events. You can register for the ones that you're interested in and um, lots of um, um, news and um, um, other resources on our website, which are available to our members. Um, this is a screenshot of the resources section of the website and you can see all the recordings of the um, lectures and uh, webinars are um, contained in that um, web page. Um, a big announcement we had recently uh, was our uh, 2020 photo competition. So um, ASICs are excited to announce this photo competition and we asked people to submit their photos featuring um, use of geosynthetics. Uh, we want you to um, send your photos to the um, email address which is on the screen, photos at um, acigs.org. On the right hand side, you see some of the photos that um, uh, was part of the IGS competition last year. And um, basically what we ask people is, um, you know, look, look um, for um, interesting photos from geosynthetic uses or applications in the um, industry or um, jobs that you're working on and um, send those to us for a, a chance to win a prize. And as you can see, $500 gift card for a winner and 200 gift card for, uh, dollar gift card for a uh, for the runner up and we have two winner categories basically for general and for um, young category which are um, people under uh, 36 years of age and um, today's webinar we thank our sponsor Tenkara Geosynthetics um, for sponsoring this event and um, they will have a brief presentation after Peter's presentation um, thank you, Tenkara Geosynthetics, for sponsoring this event. And um, today's topic is geosynthetic dewatering technologies for environmental remediation, which is presented by Peter Finlay. A brief introduction about Peter. So while starting out in the horticulture field and completing a bachelor degree in um, that area, in 1982, Peter then the diverged into civil engineering in the late 1980s to be involved with developing the composite drainage market followed then with the introduction of non-woven needle punch geotextile in New Zealand. Joining McCoffery in New Zealand over 25 years ago, Peter has had a range of roles involved with marketing of mesh products and the growing geosynthetic market. His um, horticultural experience has lent him towards a large involvement in erosion, sediment application, and environmental engineering. His current role in geofabrics, formerly McAuferry, has a focus on the containment market, which encompasses um, products and solutions used in the waste and water sectors, geomembranes, uh, geosynthetic cloud oilers, drainage geocomposites, protection geotextile, and um, geotube dewatering technology. So thank you, Peter, for um, the presentation today. And um, so I stop share from my end.
And over to you, Peter. Um, please start your presentation and share your screen. Well, uh, yes, th thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, as uh, Simic said, um, I'm going to be talking today on the use of uh, geosynthetic uh, dewatering technologies for uh, specifically for environmental remediation. And as part of this, I'm going to be relating it to a very interesting project that we've had in, in New Zealand, uh, the Copiopio Canal Remediation uh, Project. So, so the sorts of things I'm going to be covering today is, is giving an overview of the uh, geosynthetic watering um, technology, um, its development and um, the uh, applications, and um, lo looking at the components that, that make up this, um, just trying to get rid of something here, yep. Yeah. Um, the components that, that make, make up the uh, technology um, and then um, relate that to specifically the environmental remediation um, application and really focus on a overview of the uh, Copiopio project um, and looking at the uh, uh, remediation techniques that were, were used in this project. So, so first, firstly, the uh, synthetic dewatering technologies. Um, this is largely um, geotextile containers that are, are used um, in uh, hydraulic engineering applications. And they were, they were first started to be developed and used in the uh, late 1950s. And over, over the, uh, the next uh, sort of 50 odd years, these have been developed extensively um, and, and modified to what they are today. And in the um, mid 1990s, we started really seeing the, the use in environmental engineering applications, um, largely the dewatering of uh, uh, slurry waste, such as um, waste from wastewater treatment uh, plants and industrial waste. And then later in the 1990s, um, we saw the the use um, beginning for dredged and uh, contaminated sediments. And that's the area that we're going to be talking about today. So we, we see sort of two main applications. Um, one is the hydraulic engineering. And this is where the, the containers are largely used um, uh, being sand filled and to provide erosion control structures, but largely in the marine area, so uh, construction of uh, groins and uh, embankments, uh, that type of thing. So in marine and, and waterway applications. Then the other application that, um, again, we're sort of focusing on today is the environmental engineering. And this is where it's being used to contain and dewater uh, slurry wastes and including um, contaminated sediments. So, let's get a laser pointer. Um, we, we all know there's, there's, there is a range of um, technologies um, out there from your, your me me mechanical systems, your centrifuges, belt presses, chamber presses, to your more passive drying methods of um, open drying beds. And all, all these systems are being used to reduce the volume of the, the sediment, often to enable it to be safely transported to a landfill. Um, or sometimes um, for incinera incineration. So the geosynthetic um, containers, what are these? These are um, effectively large, um, or they can be small, um, geotextile containers. Uh, so they're, they're a flexible, um, a permeable tube or container um, that are really designed to contain sediments, but also allow the release of, of water. So this, 
this sort of technology has seen um, certain advantages over the mechanical um, dewatering technologies in that you are able to handle very large volumes of sludges and um, pump at very high rates. So where, where you've got a lot, lot of um, contaminated uh, sediments to process, this is a good option to look at. Over the years, the technology has been proven and you can achieve very high uh, solids capture, capture rates. And it's, um, it's, it's not cheap technology, but it's relatively low capital investment um, for setup and operation. And one of the important, the important um, parts in the environmental engineering area is that if it effectively conceals the, uh, especially if it's contaminated materials, is containing it in, in a geotextile container during and uh, following the dewatering process. So, and we, we do talk about this as, as technology and it's not just one um, component. Um, I, I generally talk about three components and uh, today I'll add in a fourth important component as well. But um, for the met methodology, there's really three things that um, uh, are very important. Firstly, you're needing to get the, the sediment or the sludge from one point to another. So there's the dredging and pumping. Um, and there's a, a need in any project to have an understanding of the type of equipment you, you need, whether it's cutter suction um, dredges, um, and the, the, the pumping capabilities to basically transfer that sludge from the source to the geosynthetic container. The second and a very, very important um, part of the process is, is the sludge conditioning treatment. And this is the addition of polymer flocculants and or coagulants um, to get effective dewatering within the ge geosynthetic container. Um, you're needing to bring the solids together, block them together and get um, large, large clumps of solid and um, separate, separate the free um, filtrate or liquid, which will be released out through the um, geotextile. The third component obviously is the geosynthetic component. So these are, uh, can be large or small containers that are, are sewn up. Um, so there's three important parts I see to this. Um, firstly, the fabric itself. Uh, it's not, you can't just get any old um, woven fabric. They are typically woven fabrics, um, but there has been a lot of research and development over the years into selecting the most appropriate fabric that it has to be able to retain the solids but also rapidly release the uh, water from um, in the dewatering process. So these fabrics are what you'd call me medium strength woven geotextiles um, with a range of types of um, fibre. The, the fabric also obviously has to have enough um, strength to with, withstand the forces during and after um, pumping. And this is the same for the seams and the port construction, the uh, filling ports. Obviously this, the seams with ge geotextiles, um, its seam strength is very important. Um, you don't want that to be the failure point. So there is uh, quite a lot of technology that's gone into the um, seaming techniques. And same with, with the ports. Er, early um, containers had issues with, with ports blowing out. And um, so there's been a lot of development of, um, to um, overcome those issues. The third part in there is, is critical and as, as a supplier of these types of units, 
Um, we see most uh, projects and, and tenders come out with maybe a volume of uh, sludge and sediment to process, but um, very little else. So what is needing to support the uh, supply of, of these containers is the ability to, to design the size and the volumes of these that are required for the project. So with all these three components, um, it's important that we have a knowledge of the composition of, of the sludge and that uh, ultimately affects the selection of the, the size um, and type of uh, geosynthetic container you use. You have to look initially at this, the sludge, um, what, what sludge volume and its percentage solids in situ this will dictate, again, the, the ultimate size of the uh, container. We need to look at the uh, particle size analysis, and this will um, give us an insight into whether we're needing um, polymer conditioning or not. Um, and all this also relates to your, your um, specific gravity and your relative density. Again, it affects what size um, geo container you can use. And all these inputs ultimately say, okay, how many units you need and how large, and it dictates the footprint you're required for your containment lay down area. So the additional component, the fourth component, and this is particularly um, important when we're dealing with contaminated um, sediments is the containment uh, compound. So it should be seen as, as part of the whole system. And uh, for, especially for contaminated material, there will be a requirement for a fully lined and uh, engineered um, containment compound. So the questions often asked is, is it going to be needing to be temporary or long-term containment? Um, for temporary, you might be able to use just a very light geomembrane, um, but for long-term applications, um, typically you'd be looking at a, um, a fully welded, maybe an HDPE 1.5 millimeter um, geomembrane. So that's, this lined compound is, is there as safety um, and also to um, allow the filtrate to be circulated back either to the, to the um, water source or if required a, a further um, treatment. There's generally a bund around the edge of the containment area and this has to be designed um, again as, as a safety Thing if um, un, in the unlikely event of a um, uh, a failure of one of these units, um, you don't want the contaminated material flowing into the surrounding environment. So just mo moving on to um, the the project itself. Um, Many of you might um, <clears throat> struggle with the name of the project, the Copiopio Canal. Um, Copiopio Canal is um, uh, this, this canal here. It's a man-made canal um, situated on the Rangitaiki Plains, uh, close to Whakatane, Whakatane Township here, which is on the uh, east coast of the North Island uh, in the uh, Bay of Plenty. So a large farming, um, agriculture, horticultural area. Um, this was built in the 1920s. Um, obviously low, low lying um, farmlands, uh, a large plain area. Um, so it was built for um, flood um, control purposes. In between the 1950s and the 1980s, um, the canal um, was contaminated from discharges from 
a uh, sawmill uh, timber treatment plant um, where the uh, impurities in the, uh, the processing chemicals um, contained dioxin. So this has been the whole issue with the, with the canal um, is uh, looking at um, the take, taking out the dioxins. So there's a, a wonderful, a very good um, objective um, for the project. And um, I think it's, it's, it's worth sort of reading out that, um, so, so safe, safe to safely remove and treat the legacy of the dioxin pollution, um, thereby restoring the Maori of the Kopio Canal and the Whakatani River and develop the full potential and contribute to the well-being of the Tangata Whenua. So for, the, for those of you who are not New, New Zealanders, I was, was told I should um, make some explanations here. And I think this is a great term here, re restoring the Maori. Uh, the Maori is, um, the meaning of that is the essence or, or life force. Um, and so restoring the Maori really refers to um, restoring the, the life sort of supporting capacity of the, the canal. So it's, it's looking at the environmental, the culture, cultural, the social um, and economic well-being of the Tangata Whenua. And the Tangata Whenua is, is uh, literally means the people of the land. So the, the, the project uh, was a joint venture between the Bay of Plenty Regional Council and central government. So the thing that is very interesting with this project is that I see it as not just a, not just a remediation of the canal. That's, that was one um, part of it. Um, obviously, removal of the contaminant um, will effectively um, remediate that canal, but it also meant the uh, remediation of the uh, the dredged material, and this was going to be um, a bioremediation process, which I'll talk more about. So the whole project involved very high level of community liaison. There was a lot of in interest in here. And I must um, sort of acknowledge that the, the council um, put out very comprehensive information, their, their website. If you type in Copiopio Canal, um, you'll find extensive inf information on there. And it was largely aimed at keeping the community up to date with what was happening. So the early stages of the project, there was a uh, full-scale um, pilot project um, trial demonstration. Uh, the project was uh, tendered and awarded and being really a design and build contract, the design of the containment sites and the geosynthetic contain containers sort of followed on from there. It started construction of the first um, containment um, site in uh, May 2017 and then pumping starting um, 2018 and completed in 2019. As, as I said, there was a lot of community um, liaison <laughs> And this, this is a snapshot of one of the, uh, I guess, the, the poster boards and the info on the uh, council website. Um, and just, just a good outline of the project, the, um, the, the history of it, the community um, input, some facts on the, on the project, um, the methodology, and then the rem remediation. Um, so there's, there's a lot of this information on their website. And so this, this is the Copiopio Canal um, in yellow. That is the area that was going to be um, dredged and uh, desilted. Um, when, we, when I talk about CS1, this is containment site one at this end and con containment site three at the other end.
So getting on to this question of what, why um, geosynthetic dewatering technology was um, looked at uh, for this project. And but firstly, we need to understand, and we've talked about the objectives, um, but we do, do have to understand firstly what the contaminant is. And um, as I've said, the contaminant was uh, dioxin, and dioxin binds strongly to the sediment. And uh, once bound, it's not released into the water, so it's not, not soluble. So that, so that um, input dictates how we're going to handle the um, sediment. The uh, canal was very flat grade. Um, it was uh, um, tidal influence, but um, effectively with the grade, it was me meant that the uh, sediment wasn't going to be washed out into the sea. Um, and also, it, it is slow to break down, so it's going to be in the environment for a long time. The dioxin can also accumulate in the food chain. And so this was a, a very important driver for the local community. They wanted to be able to um, catch and eat the eels, um, ha harvest um, watercress out of the uh, canal. Um, so that was very important. Uh, the sediment had also built up, so it um, wasn't um, as efficient in um, the flood control function. So the, the early methodologies, and this started back um, in uh, 2010, so it's been looked at for a long time, um, and the first proposals were uh, excavation I'll dig and dump, um, excavate and dispose at a landfill. Uh, because it was it is contaminated material, it had to be um, transferred, transported to a controlled uh, landfill. Uh, and that would have meant a um, uh, three to four hour um, transport time. Uh, so they, that methodology was, was not accepted because of the risk of spillage and the large number of transport uh, movements. The second option was the, um, again, excavation, but just transport and placement in the three containment sites close to the uh, canal. Again, this, this wasn't accepted um, because of, um, I guess, da dangers of spillage and also exposed drying beds from uh, uh, potential um, dust which would transport uh, the dioxin on uh, particles. So the, the project team worked closely with the community and uh, they settled on a uh, two-stage pro process. One, one was the to safely remove and store the um, contaminated material and then the second phase to clean up that by um, bioremediation. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so now, I guess, really to, to answer the, the question about, um, you know, why in the end um, geosynthetic containers were, were selected, it comes down to the statement of, of safely uh, safe removal, containment, and remediation. So with the dioxin bound to the soil particles, um, dust and sediment spillage through trucking was seen as the major risk. So if we could have a system methodology that mitigated those, um, that was the way it wanted to be driven. So we look at, at the technology. So first, first of all, the uh, dredging uh, side of things, uh, that was seen as um, offering the, the least disturbance of the sediment within the canal. The sediment would then be pumped along a, uh, a, a large um, pipe, um, and that took away those, uh, that traffic in, in, um, input. And, in, in the pipe system, obviously, it's enclosed. Um, hopefully, um, there, there wouldn't be any um, ruptures of pipes, but as, as long as that didn't happen, the, the, um, uh, the 
contaminated sediment was fully um, contained and enclosed throughout the whole process from, from the dredging to um, putting it into the geo container. Again, as I said, that's an all fully um, enclosed. And then this is all housed in the containment compound, uh, so um, securing that so it can't um, contaminate surrounding areas and was able to be then um, uh, therefore facilitating the bioremediation. So the geo containers were seen as a cost effective um, uh, solution, uh, being able to um, process those, those large amounts of, of sediment um, and a relatively low, low risk when you look at contamination of the surrounding environment by, by taking away that, that airborne potential and also transport risks. Um, also not affected by, by water once it's contained in, in, in the geotextile container, um, water doesn't tend to get um, into it and re-wet it up. Um, it was pro proven and um, by, by having it in contained um, units, um, it, it was in a, a position that uh, facilitated the bioremediation. Uh, methodology. So as I said, they, there was a um, pilot pilot trial, and this this was put in place for several reasons. Uh, firstly, to prove the the methodology, um, there was always skeptics al along the way, so um, it needed to be proved that um, this system uh, would would work. Um, and the community were very much involved with that. There was a lot of um, open days, and uh, while that um, trial was happening, there was um, displays and um, a lot of um, little seminars and um, information uh, being disseminated. And also, we wanted to get some information on um, the handling of the contaminated sediment. Um, so what were we going to collect all the di dioxin in the um, dredged material? So you'll see there's a schematic and this is one of the information boards, but a, a, a very nice um, aerial view of the trial site. So we had a uh, cutter suction dredge um, mounted on a hydraulic excavator. Um, this would later be uh, mounted on, on a barge and operate down the canal. Um, a sediment curtain to contain any um, disturbed sediment. Um, this was then pumped into holding tanks or equalization tanks. Then the polymer um, added and then pumped into the uh, geo containers that were in large um, hook bins or skip bins. And then the filtrate was monitored and uh, before it was discharged back into the canal and uh, found um, a very, very good collection of the uh, dikes and contaminated sediments within the geo containers. So once the tender had been awarded, as I said, it was, it was largely a um, design and build contract. So um, then we got involved with uh, sizing of the geo containers and um, there wasn't a lot of information. There was a, 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 a rough volume and percentage solid. So we had to base the size and the number of um, geotube um, on that, that, those figures and try and maximize the volume that we could fit into two containment sites. Containment site one, large rectangular area, um, there was no problem sizing units. Um, CS3, 
is was a um, long, narrow, irregular shape. So there was some challenges there. So as I've shown before, these are the sort of inputs, and we had forty thousand cubic meters at a um, certain percentage solids, um, the pumping details, and then um, what we expected the um, dewatered uh, cake to be within the containers. And this is what we, uh, the process we went through to establish the number and sizes of um, geo containers. So the, the actual um, containment sites uh, was also a very um, big part of the, the project and an important part to contain the, uh, the sediments or the, um, the filtrates from the uh, containers. Um, so the, the things that had to be considered in, in here um, was that the, it had to be fully able to fully contain the, um, all the filtrate. Um, it was required, the cells required to be functional for 20 years because that's the number of years that they were, um, are anticipating that the bioremediation project um, will um, take. There was also some geotechnical um, issues with soft subgrade and high water tables and uh, differential settlement, uh, especially in the CS3 site and both sites had to be designed for seismic loadings which added some other um, uh, complexity to it. So here we have uh, con con containment site one uh, which was um, fully lined with uh, 1.5 millimeter HDPE um, over a two, 250 gram uh, geotextile approximately 30,000 square meters. And it was designed, or the, the containers designed in there, um, we were able to fit a maximum of 29 units um, of 27 meter circumference by 57 meter long. So um, very, very big units, um, especially for us in New Zealand. And as I said, containment site three had some uh, uh, difficult challenges. As you can see, it's a very long, um, irregular shape. And you'll see here just about every uh, geo container was a, a different length um, to be able to maximize the amount of volume that we could fit in there. There was the canal along here, so this stop bank. Um, had to have some design to ensure that it was um, globally um, stable. And in the, this section of the uh, containment cell had also been used in the past as a dump site for um, wood wastes. And so it had potential for differential settlement. So in, in the end, the, the design for the sub uh, base improvements included geotextiles, uh, one or two layers of uh, uh, geogrid and geogrid within the embankment. And then it was selected to use LLDPE, low de density, linear low density uh, polyethylene. Uh, as the uh, geomembrane, um, as it was more able to um, I cope with a, a potential differential settlement. So just I'm conscious of the time, keep moving on. Um, I've already talked about a number of these things, but some, some of the interesting things, um, if you noticed, it was quite a long time from the start of the construction of the containment site one to start um, putting their jet containers in and pumping. Um, this, this was because at that time we had the Edgecombe floods, which um, uh, there was a burst flood bank, which um, uh, inundated a, um, a small community of Edgecombe and a lot of the um, resources got pulled off the, uh, this project 
um, to do other uh, flood remediation works um, and also the site had to dry out considerably before they could um, uh, start um, uh, excavating. Some of the things that additional things I haven't talked about much but there was continual cultural monitoring they had to make sure there was no uh, Maori artifacts or human um, bones or anything like that turn up in the uh, dredge material and there was sieving of the larger stone particles so that wasn't going into the geosynthetic container. The whole process had to be um, uh, mindful that it had to facilitate the bioremediation and there was also um, lime so there was lime added to um, uh, affect the pH and wood fiber added um, to provide organic matter later for the um, organisms. So the bioremediation and, and this, uh, this is a, a very interesting um, facet of this project I think because I th in any of these types of projects we need to get away from the, 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 the dig and dump and just transferring um, contaminated material to another site. Um, so here the use of fungi, bacteria and plants to naturally degrade the di dioxins. This is a schematic of uh, CS1, so once the containers were filled they would be inoculated uh, with the bacteria and fungi, um, covered over with uh, soil and then planted into. So I'll have to um, just um, uh, mentioned that the, this this is a slide um, from a presentation by Pro, Prof um, Chris Anderson and Dr. Joe Kelly from University of Waikato. Um, it's, it's a very good presentation which is um, also on the uh, Regional Council um, website and uh, it's worth looking at to get a full understanding of the bioremediation process. But it's a nice little summary to basically say to get your effective bioremediation first of all well we've got the dioxin as the um, contaminant you need conducive environment there we had moisture in the containers we had our oxygen plenty of nutrient because this is this is sediment off um, farmland the ph was um, corrected and temperature was okay and then the introduction in the containers of the uh, microorganisms and plants. So the fungi, bacteria and trees were planted in there. So this is what they're wanting to achieve. Um, effectively there was uh, wood fibre um, impregnated into the um, sediment they put an additional um, layer on and then inoculated and covered and planted. The, the trees excrete um, sugars which um, then fuel these microorganisms um, to create um, the uh, enzymes and that for breakdown of the, the toxins. So where are we now? Um, once uh, geotube pumping had all been completed, um, then they were inoculated, then covered over with, with topsoil, um, planted in with grasses and uh, willows and poplar stakes, just directly through the geotextiles into there, um, and now um, greening up nicely. So this, this is the site, they didn't get the whole area covered in the first season. The ultimate aim is to get the whole lot covered. Um, but as you can see, it's all greening up. Um, the Kaikuya grass is establishing very nicely. That was a large project and um, just have to mention that, you know, these, this sort of system can be used obviously for smaller projects as well and um, we're seeing more and more application for this for um, the silting of streams and stormwater control ponds and systems 
where just a small dredge is um, able to get into these, these difficult sites and often just pumping into small containers housed in, um, in hook bins which after a, um, uh, several, um, uh, even, even a, a week's dewatering, then um, they would um, be able to be taken to landfill. And again, another site where just a small temporary compound uh, pump in, um, allowed to dewater for um, this was probably a couple of months, and then go in and excavate and remove that um, sediment. So I think in conclusion, I, I hope I've shown that these technologies definitely have application in um, uh, remediation, uh, environmental remediation uh, projects, um, whether it's large canals, um, streams, stormwater containments, uh, and uh, marinas. So just very quickly, I just have um, a couple more photographs of um, maybe of interest. Um, you can see these these geosynthetic containers are uh, quite large beasts. They pump up to um, uh, two point five meter, two point six meter height, um, and. Uh, here, here was the uh, collected um, sediments or the oversized sediments, which was able to be used as full, full material. As I said, they're very large units and this was CS1 um, before it's being filled over. The um, conditioning, this is, this is what you aim to get good, good um, settlement and um, uh, Good, good clean filtrate. And this was the removal of the oversized um, material and also the, cult, the cultural monitoring. So just final acknowledgements, um, Bay of Plenty Regional Council, the Ministry of Environment, um, also uh, University of Waikato and the head contractor was um, Enviro NZ. Um, there was a lot of other people involved with it, but we couldn't mention all of those. So thank, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate it. It's a very quick run through, but um, I hope you've uh, got something out of it. Very good. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Um, I finish on time and um, I think I'll go to Brendan now for um, his uh, brief presentation and we come back uh, to both of you with the questions at the end. Um, Brendan, if you are online, can you please share your screen and your video as well? Uh, you've got me on block for video, CMAC, but I've got my got the screen there. So excellent. So is that all okay? All good. Yep. Thanks very much, Peter. It was. Uh, it was excellent to see the, the, the system in action. So um, just to finish up today, I'll, I'll, I won't take very long at all. I just want to quickly introduce Tincato Geosynthetics and then just show a case, a few uh, case studies of, of geotubes in action. So Tincato Geosynthetics is one of the larger geosynthetic companies in the world, um, specialists around non-woven and woven, uh, technologies and in, uh, in, in geosynthetics and and uh, obviously one of the more advanced ones in terms of application knowledge experience and quality and, and so forth these are the, the families of geosynthetics we have under the brand so the polyfelt um, family is really the non wovens and geocomposite family uh, or groups of products uh, Marafi is the woven high performance woven geotextiles the mirror grid is the well-known polyester grid and the geotubes is the family of products that we're, we're talking about today. And just in terms of reach, you can see the in terms of manufacturing, USA, Europe, uh, Asia, as well as distribution and sales presence throughout the, throughout the world. And down here in the Australia, PNG, New Zealand, South Pacific region, uh, we have a long-term relationship with Geofabrics. 
So just turning quickly to YouTubes to, to flesh out a little bit of what uh, Peter had. Um, this is a, a, a slide we use to showcase the performance uh, from the start of terms of initial solids concentration of what you pumped into the tube and what you get at the end of the last pumping cycle. So with a geotube, uh, you get more than one pumping cycle. You pump it up, dewaters, you pump it up, dewaters, you pump it up, dewaters, and so forth. So this, these are the type of performance improvements uh, you get for the different types of waste streams. The only caveat that you put on it is the tube is just one part of it, uh, of the system. And there's a, there's a bit, of an, bit of science that goes into the polymer dosing. So generally what we do uh, with clients is take a small amount of, of sludge or, or the sample uh, that's going to be dewatered and then run it through a couple of different quick tests. So you can see on the right, uh, there's a couple of examples. And that way you can get the, the, the dosage of the polymer uh, optimised earlier than, than otherwise you, you would get. And you can see the performance difference there, but going from sludge all the way through to, to getting the right recipe. And Geofabrics has this capability uh, on, their, on their Gold Coast laboratory. So just stepping through uh, three or four short case studies so you can see some, some key points. Um, they're all mining case studies because the, the waste streams can be quite varied. In this job here in, in Indonesia, we had uh, large settling ponds, did not want to make any more, just wanted to take the sludge out of the settling ponds and reuse the water. Created a pad. Um, you can see here, we started to stack them up. So we had three different pads and we got as high as three units high on the, uh, on the, on the highest one. The bottom, but the bottom tubes are longer than the top tubes and the top tubes shingle or overlap across the, the bottom tubes and that's for stability purposes. But just to give you a, a sense of scale, these tubes here are 101 metres long and a circumference of nearly 37 metres. So these are quite big, uh, quite big units and you can see that the bunding there to get the, um, the, to collect the water and reprocess it through. Another project in Asia, but in this case, the, I just wanted to show, that, so this is similar in terms of its large scale. So I've got a stack of four in the smaller pond and we stack them five high over here. But obviously we've removed the outer sheath. So the woven fabric or the geotube itself has been removed. And you can see the, how well the waste stream is consolidated or dewatered inside, that it's still standing up and uh, after being exposed. Okay, a little bit of erosion there, but you can see the, the imprint of the circumferential seams, um, that's how well it was, was dewatering. So this was quite a big job, um, similar scale to the Copioca job tubes, the 52 metres long, large diameter, uh, 180,000 cubic metres of, of dry solids. Looking at a smaller project, I mean, this is a classic um, sediment pond clean out. Um, you can see the liner placed there, in this case it's just a relatively thin plastic liner, a couple of different tubes um, at, at each end. And you, I think we would have started filling at the outside and then come to the inside to ensure um, uh, you know, they don't roll or start to move. But in this case here, the ability was to reuse the water. You can see how well it was, uh, the sludge was dewatered and they reprocessed that through the system, through the mining uh, process to, to get, get the, any remnants of ore out. So this was a case where the sediment pond was, was getting um, filled up with sediment and was starting to cause problems for the mine site in terms of process capability. And again, just to showcase the performance of the dewatering, um, anyone involved with, uh, has had involvement with bauxite uh, mines with the red, red, red mud waste, knows it's uh, particularly problematic. Um, in this case here, we as a trial of one tube. We did not use any polymer, but you can see how well it dewatered and, and, and the, the quality of the, you know, the, the, the cake that was left behind. Um, so this, this trial was just, just to showcase the, the tube in action, and it would have been even greater performance with the right uh, polymer dosage. And the last one we'll show is 
I suppose, the, again, the, 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 the classic um, sediment pond that's filled up, in, in this case here, quite thick sludge. They were cleaning it out, but because it was a HDPE-lined uh, structure, they would nick it with the, the machines, and then they have to get in, empty it out, get in and repair it, and so forth. So it was was causing a bit of disruption, and by simply changing the process to dewatering the sludge th through the uh, geotube system um, using polymers, uh, it, it it freed up all that inefficiency on the on the mine site. So they're the they're the case studies and a little bit about Tenkara. Um, I thank you, Essex, CMAC, and Peter for the time. And uh, I'll hand back to yourselves and hope you're a little bit more wiser about geotube dewatering. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Brendan. And uh, thank you again, Peter. I have received <clears throat> a couple of questions. I'll just run through those questions very quickly. Yep. Um, so the question about um, what kind of dredging pump, uh, that's the question about the uh, um, project you presented, um, Peter, um, was used for that project and mentioned the dredged material was um, including some coarse particles. Um, what sort of pump was used in that project? Yeah, look, I, I probably can't give you a full full rundown, but it, it was um, ra rather than a cutter section, um, it's the, the head on the uh, uh, basically um, jet jetted um, water. It was it was a hydraulic jet that that disturbed up because the the, um, the the base and then basically just so suctioned up from from that. I, I don't have um, or I have pictures of it, um, but I'm I'm not a pumping ex expert. But um, ra rather than a a, a cutting um, action, it, it was blasting and basically ho hoovering up. Um, suctioning up the uh, the sediment as it was dislodged. Okay, and uh, you can jump in, Brendan, if you have any additional comments anywhere. Um, the other question about um, very uh, famous question about PFAS remediation. Um, have you found any um, um, sort of application for PFAS remediation um, with the dewatering solutions? Um. And, and whether Brendan can make a comment too, I'm not too sure. But but um, my understanding with with P, PFAS, the the issue is that it's very very soluble and very mobile. Um, so um, if the geotube dewatering technology and that is going to work very well for anything that's contaminant that's um, associated and, and bound to the, um, the the particles um, because you can basically collect 90% plus of, of the solids component. Um, with with other soluble materials there the may be ways of drawing those out, out of solution. Um, in some situations we use just, um, just, just polymer flocculants, sometimes it's a combination of flocculants and, and coagulants but Look, I, I haven't had any experience in New Zealand where we're we're looking at it for for P, PFAS. It it may be something in in the future, um, but if if it's if it's if you can't um, draw it out of solution, then it's basically going to be re released in the um, in in the uh, filtrate. And, and I think. Um from what little I know, PFAS, the internal discussions have been around, seems to be in Australia and USA um, leading the charge at the moment, trying to find solutions for PFAS. And it, Peter's exactly right. I don't think containing it in a geotube would be the sole solution. I think there would have to be some additional treatments afterwards to to really, really clean it up. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, question is about um, percentage solid. Um, what is there a particular range for the percentage solid um, for these um, geotubes? Uh, what's that for? Um, uh, is that question. Um, what for for pump for pumping? There's always a, a, a limitation. Um, you know, you're you're pumping a, um, a fairly dilute 
um, solution. You can't be um, pumping very high high solids in there. G generally, um, you know, you're in that um, three three percent to um, ten, or maybe a maximum of fifteen percent. It, de it depends on the type of sed sediment. With um, uh, municipal effluent, it's always very low, low percentage. Um, you know, you're, you're looking at uh, two or three percent solids. Um, I think it, in the Copio project, they they were able to pump around sort of ten or twelve percent solids um, in there. Okay, so and I had um, a number of questions about the design, which um, I don't think we have time to go through. No. I I imagine. Um, your organization will have um, design support throughout the yes. project if um, um, any of the engineers have um, like a um, application in their uh, in their jobs yeah 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 no that's um you know and um, we I do a certain amount in house and and um, I draw heavily on, on um, the engineers in uh, Tenkade in in Asia and um, you know, they're, they've got a lot of experience, um, both on the construction side of things, but um, un understanding the, the sediment um, and applying that to design of the size of the, the containers. And I saw there's a, there's a question there about the selection of the, the type of geotech style. Um, I think largely for this sort of work, um, Tenkare over the years have really um, select, selected pretty much one, one fabric and it's the GT500 um, which um, does the majority of applications. Where, where we see different, different fabrics being used is in the coastal application um, where you're dealing with heavier sands um, there will be a different grade used and there's, there's some lower, lower tech um, applications where you're not using um, polymers that they may use a, um, a, a lighter G GT300 um, type grade but gen generally 90% um, of the work's done with um, uh, one, one geotextile. Okay and last question clogging um, can that be a, a problem for this um, for the geotube applications? And um, if by any chance the the tube clogs, are there any solutions to um, fix the problem? Oh, okay. Well, for, yeah. For, firstly, I guess there's, there's two answers. One is um, firstly the I can't stress um, enough the importance of getting the um, polymer or your flocculant. Um, dose, dosage right. That will largely be the thing that contributes to either the fabric um, not not containing all the sediment and the sediment if you're un, under under flocculated um, you'll get sediment released just through the fabric um, totally. If you're over flocculated you get a very slimy and um, thick um, gooey mess and, and that will blind off inside the the fabric. So firstly get that right and, and you'll get a very good release of water. Um, over time, yes, there is some caking up of the inside of the container. Um, where you're doing multiple pumpings, they'll often go through and you just need to break the surface tension and um, they'll just do a bit of maintenance and that's, that's often um, vibration or um, just just a, a water blast just just to break up that um, crust that might form on, on or under the surface and then you'll reactivate it basically and, and get through the release of um, the, the liquid. Okay cool um, so thanks a lot Peter uh, for a very um, interesting presentation and thank you Brendan for your presentation. Um, I think um, everyone um, enjoyed this webinar today. Um, so as I mention every time, um, this webinar has been recorded and will be uh, available on ASIC's website um, very shortly. Um, 
Before I say um, goodbye, I just um, remind everyone that um, our next webinar will be in July and it's a very interesting um, topic that uh, we've asked uh, Professor uh, Malik Bueza from Monash University about the very um, challenging and um, interesting topic of PFAS. So um, I uh, encourage everyone to participate in that webinar, which is going to be um, in, in July. So more details will be announced on our website. Please um, check the website uh, for details. And um, that's what we have time for today. Um, thanks, Peter. Thanks, Brendan. And thanks, everyone, for attending and watching this webinar. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.